Hello, thank you for joining me. Today we're going to have a quick look at some topics that might be useful for GCSE Maths Revision, uh, focusing on some foundation tier topics. So, first uh, set of questions I've got to say is on parts of a circle. So, I've got a green line here, and that green line is going from the centre of the circle um, to the edge, or the circumference, and that is the radius. Okay. The length of the actual line, or the perimeter of the circle, is known as the circumference. I've got this green line here. Now, this green line goes all the way across the circle through the center. So that is the diameter. This green line here, that goes all the way across the circle, but it doesn't go through the center. So that is a chord. And then we have this shape up here that's enclosed by the chord. And that shape there is known as a segment. So it looks like a segment of orange or segment of chocolate orange. Um, down here, we've got this part there that looks like a slice of cake or a slice of pizza. And that's called a sector. And just one on this one. So if you have almost like the crust of a pizza there, that part there, that is known as the arc. We then also have this green line, and that green line that's just touching the outside of the circle is known as the tangent. So let's have a quick look at how we'd work out the area and circumference of a circle. So there's a couple of really useful formulas here. So area of a circle we would do by pi r squared. So that's pi times r squared. So we have to be a little bit careful with the order of operations because we've got the squared, which is an index, and multiplication between pi and the radius squared. Um, so let's just do an example quickly. Let's say that this radius is, I don't know, eight centimeters. So I would do area equals pi times eight squared, because eight is the radius. So area, well, if I work this out, so eight squared, is 64 so area is 64 pi centimeter squared so that is my answer in terms of pi um so that's kind of an exact answer but then i could work it out exactly by typing this in the calculator so i'm just going to type it into my calculator that i've got here and when i press the sd button to turn this answer into a decimal i get 201.1 centimeter squared and that happens to be to one decimal place um, let's say oh, I want to work out the circumference instead. There's two ways of doing it. Um, we do pi times the diameter, um, or some people would do it as circumference equals 2 pi r. So that's 2 times pi times the radius. And they're both the same thing because if we double the radius, we get the diameter anyway. Now, these two formulas will be given to you on the formula sheet if you're sitting this in um, summer of 2023, but in the future you might not get a formula sheet. Um, so let's just say that this um, diameter may be, I don't know, 10 centimetres. If it then asks us to work out the circumference, I would do pi times the diameter. And if the diameter is 10, that's going to be 10 pi. Now, because it's a length, that's just in centimetres. And again, I could just type that into a calculator. So if I do it to one decimal place, I'm going to get 31.4 centimetres. Okay. So that's the one decimal place. Changing topic a little bit to go on to sequences. So we've got um, at the top, we're looking at arithmetic sequences first. So sometimes these are known as linear sequences. So these are kind of related to straight lines. Um, and an arithmetic sequence increases or decreases by the same amount each time. So looking at this particular arithmetic sequence, I can see here that the term to term rule is to add on three okay now we can get an nth term rule or sometimes known as a position to term rule i'll show you how to do that in a moment the next uh, type of sequence we've got is a geometric sequence so with a geometric sequence we are either multiplying or dividing by the same amount each time to get from term to term so here i can see that that's been doubled it's been doubled it's been doubled and so on. So if I wanted to keep this going, if I doubled that again, I'm going to get to 96. So 
I can use that term to term rule to keep on going. So really useful to know the difference between an arithmetic sequence uh, and a geometric sequence. So we've then got Fibonacci. So you need to just recognize the type of Fibonacci sequences really and be able to apply it. So we're adding the two previous terms together. So one plus one gives me two. One plus two gives me three. Two add three gives five. Three add five gives eight. Five add eight gives 13. 13 add 21 um, gives 34. Okay, and so on. So if I wanted to find the next term, I'd have to do 21 add 34, and that's going to give me 55 as my next term. Then we've got quadratic sequences. Now, quadratic, or this particular quadratic sequence, is the square numbers, very much related to square numbers. So the square numbers I've just written here, so 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36. So the nth term for this particular sequence is just n squared. What you might notice here is we're adding 3, then we're adding 5, and then we're adding 7, and then we're adding 9. And then we're adding 11. So next we have to add 13 and we'll get to 49, which makes sense because that's 7 times 7, which is 7 squared. So we can see a pattern there and we can build it up. Um, what's useful is to be able to kind of relate this sort of thing. So if I had a sequence that was 2, 5, 10, 17, 26, 37, 50, what I'd want to be looking at thinking, OK, this seems fairly familiar. And we've got actually the same differences each time. So add three, add five, add seven, and so on. But these are just the square numbers, but all of the numbers have incre been increased by one, so they're one bigger. So this purple sequence here, the nth term for that would be n squared, add one, for example. Then at the bottom, we've got some uh, the triangular numbers, which come up from time to time. And the sequence here, so if I look, I'm adding two, then I'm adding three. Then I'm adding four. Then I'm adding five. So for the next one, I'm going to add on six. So that's going to be 21. Let's then find the next one, add on seven. That's going to get me to 28 and so on and so on. So what I've got here is these are a couple of arithmetic sequences or you might refer to them as linear sequences. And we might want to find what's called the nth term rule. So I can see that the pattern here is increasing in fours. So if I just wanted to work out what the next term in the sequence was, I can say, OK, well, it's going to be 29. I can see that. But let's say I wanted to work out what the 100th term in the sequence is or something like that. That's going to be a bit trickier. So what's the most famous sequence that increases um, in four each time? Well, it's the four times table. So we would represent that as 4n, four times a number. OK. However, this isn't the four times table because the four times table just goes 4, 8, 12, 16 and so on. So we've got to find the link between them. And there's a couple of different ways. One of the ways that I really like is called finding the zeroth term. So if I just imagine what would go before the first term if I was working backwards. So here I'd have to take away four. So if I'm working backwards, I could say, well, actually, that would be a five because we go five, then add on four to get to nine, add on four to get to 13 and so on. And that zeroth term, so that's called the zeroth term just there, um, is a five. So the nth term rule would be 4n plus 5. So if it then asks me to find out what the 100th term in that sequence is, well, I'm going to be doing 4 times my number. Now, if my number is 100, I'll be doing 4 times 100, add on 5. 405 is the 100th term in that particular sequence. I could also find out if a number is in the sequence or not fairly quickly. So let's say they wanted to say, well, is 50 in this sequence if I kept going would 50 appear in that sequence so what I could do is I could write an equation for it and if the solution to this equation is an integer a whole number then it will be in the sequence if it's not then it won't be in the sequence so what I have to do first is subtract 5 from both sides and even just at this stage I can see that this isn't going to be an integer 45 is not a multiple of 4 so 50 would not appear in that particular sequence uh, with the nth term 4n plus 5. So I've got another linear sequence or arithmetic sequence further down. Now this time it's a decreasing sequence, it's going down each time. And I can see that these are going down in fives. Okay. 
So again, if I want to find out what the next number is, it's pretty straightforward. So if I take away another five, it's actually my next number in that sequence is going to be zero. So if it's decreasing in fives, the start of my nth term rule is going to be negative five. And this is effectively linked to the negative five times table. Again, I need to find out kind of what this adjustment factor is um, to make this match up with what I've got. So this, you know, negative five times table. I need to find out what's the link that's going to get me there each time. So if I was to work backwards this time, this would actually be adding on five. That missing term would be 35. So I've got negative five n add 35. So that's the sequence. If I really wanted to write this in a slightly fancy way, I might happen to swap the order of those terms. These are the same thing, um, just written in a slightly different format. But there you go, that's what I would probably do. We work on decimal multipliers, which is really useful when we do percentage work. If I've got a calculator, like you'll have for papers two and three, if you're doing, for example, AQA, and it gives you a question like 5 to 28% of 350 pounds, I would use a decimal multiplier. So I would convert 28% into a decimal, which is 0 0.8, uh, sorry, 0 0.28. The word of is telling us to multiply, and I could just type in 0 0.28 times 350. So I'm just going to do that quickly and it gives me an answer of this of 98 pounds. So that's all I need to type in to my calculator to get the answer. If you're not confident in doing the decimal multipliers just like that, um, remember, sorry, remember that a percentage is really a special type of fraction out of 100. So I could just write 28 over 100 as a fraction and again times by 350 pounds to get my answer. It'll give you exactly the same answer. Um, I just find it quicker to write it as 0 0.28. So that's a fairly standard question. If it was a little bit more um, nuanced, it might give us a question like increase 60 pounds by 15%. So we want to find what's 15% extra on that 16, sorry, 60 pounds. So this time my decimal multiplier is going to have to be the original 100% add on the extra 15% that you've got in. So our decimal multiplier is going to have to represent 115%. So as a decimal multiplier, that's 1.15. And if you're not sure, again, where to get that from, that's 115 over 100 or divided by 100. So again, we can use multiplication and we're increasing 60 pounds. So if I type this in 1.15 multiplied by 60, it should give me a number bigger than 60. And it actually gives me 69 pounds so that's my answer so 1.15 times 60 equals 69 pounds that's done it in one step so it's not a long or lengthy question it's quite nice to do in the next question you're going to change pen color um so this time it's decreasing by eight percent so if we start with 100 percent and we take off eight percent because we're decreasing so it's going down that leaves us with 92 percent so i need to find 92 percent so as a decimal that's 0.92 Use it as a multiplier, so I'm multiplying, and my amount is £560. So this is a decrease, so when I type this in, my answer should be lower than 560 So if I have a look, now it gives me the answer of 515.2. Now that's what it says in my calculator. However, if I've got that as a question, I need to put a zero on because this is money, it's currency. I wouldn't write it as 515.2. So I need to kind of show that it's pounds and pence set. Final question is um, perhaps a little bit trickier. So find uh, the final value if an account has compound interest of 3% for five years um, if £200 was invested originally. So we're doing compound interest rather than simple interest. So this is kind of a fairly real life situation. So if I've got, you know, 8% interest for a year, I'll have you know, a bit extra, and then my interest on the next year is going to include the interest on my original amount and this extra bit too. So let's have a look at how we do this. So again, I'm going to use a multiplier. So my multiplier here for 3% is going to be 1.03 because I'm going to have my original amount, my original 100% of my money that's in the bank, and then getting an extra 3%. Now, if we were doing this for five years, I could just do 
multiply by 1.03, multiply by 1.03, and so on. However, the quickest way to do it is to use index notation. So I can do that to the power of 5, and if my original amount was 200, I'm just going to write it this way around, so 200 pounds multiplied by 1.03 to the power of 5. So let's type it in. 200 multiplied by 1.03, use my power button on my calculator, and I'm going to have to round this one slightly. So 231 pounds, 85 pence to the nearest penny. OK, so again, useful skill to be able to do. So let's do a little bit on direct and inverse proportion. Um, lots of different people use different ways of setting these questions out. So in the first question, which is a direct proportion question, um, I've got 300 grams of flour, um, and I'm going to say that that can make 12 cakes. I'm not sure what this cake this is recipe for, but never mind. Um, and then how many cakes could you make using 360 grams of the flour? So I'll be tempted to lay it out what I call the six pack method. Um, so we've got our flour, and that's in grams, and our cakes. And I'm going to just start off by putting in the thing that I know, which is 300 grams can make 12 cakes. Now, what I want to find out is how many cakes I can make with 360 grams. So it depends on the numbers that we've got. Um, and this might not be the actual choice that I'd make with this set of numbers. But if you're not sure that you have a calculator, I'd be tempted to use what we call the unitary method. So I'd put one in between the two numbers that you've got, whether these two numbers on the left or on the right. It doesn't really matter. OK, so we're using direct proportion. So this is multiplicative reasoning. So to get from 300 to 1, I divide by 300. And then I multiply by 360 to get from 1 to 360. And if I do that on the left, then I can also do it on the right. So again, just a case now, type that in. So 12 divided by 300 gives me 1 25th, which is 0 0.04. So I can make a 25th of a cake with one gram. Um, and then I need to multiply that by 360. And that gives me 14.4 cakes. Now, actually, that's not terribly useful in this case because you can't really have 0.4 of a cake. Um, I'm not sure how useful that is, but never mind. We can definitely make 14 cakes and we'll have a little bit of flour spare. So that is direct proportion. The more flour you have, the more cakes you can make. The next question we're going to look at involves what we call inverse proportion. OK, and in inverse proportion, as one thing increases, the other thing decreases. But we can use a very similar method. We just need to tweak it slightly. So this time we get told it takes 15 builders, 40 days to complete a project. So I might just do some headers here. So builders and days. I don't know, it takes 15 builders, 40 days. How long would it take eight builders to complete the same project? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put the eight builders in. We want to find out this bit here. How long does it take them to do it? It would make sense that it's going to take them more time. So more days to do it because there's less of them. And again, I can use that unitary method. So here, um, that's being divided by 15, and then we multiply by eight. Now, because this is inverse proportion, as one thing gets bigger, the other thing gets smaller, and you have to just be able to identify these, you have to be able to look at the situation and think, uh, as one thing increases, is the other thing going to increase or decrease? So if I have fewer builders, it's gonna take them longer. So when it's inverse proportion, we do the inverse operation on the other side. So if I divide it by 15 on the left, I'm going to multiply by 15 on the right. And if I'm multiplied by eight on the left, I'm going to divide by eight on the right. So 40 multiplied by 15 is 600. And then we want to do 600 divided by eight. It takes some 75 days. Now that seems reasonable. Um, we've got just over half the amount of builders. So it takes us just less. Uh, than double the amount of time. I have put here at the end, what assumption do we need to make with this particular question? Well, we're going to assume that each builder works at the same rate um, and, so, and so on. So we, we have to sometimes make some assumptions with some of these questions. A little bit on linear graphs now. So linear graphs, straight line graphs. Um, 
they have the general formula y equals mx plus c. So a few things I'm going to mention here. So when we have coordinates, we write them in the order x and then y because of alphabetical order, and they are going to relate to the axes. So y to the sky and x is across. So that's why we have the x and the y in this function. We then have the m. So the number or the thing in front of the um, a variable x is called the coefficient of x. And then we've got this c at the end, and that c, if I can spell it, sorry, Mr. Anasa, um, that's supposed to, so I'm going to cross it out and do it again. It's supposed to say constant. So that's my constant. Now, these are very useful things because those words are just general words that you need, is well worth knowing here. But the M tells you the gradient of the linear graph. So if you can find the coefficient of X, that is the gradient. If you can find out the value of C, the constant, that tells you the Y intercept. So let's have a look at this graph that I've got on this page to the left and see if we can work out the formula. So if I've got a question like this, and it asks me to write the function or write the equation, of a linear graph, I'd probably just start off by writing y equals mx plus c. So start by writing that down. So let's see if we can work out the gradient first. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find what we call a lattice point here. So there's a lattice point. Um, it's just where the line of the graph is going through, you know, a corner of one of those grid squares. So from that point, I'm going to go across one unit to the right. We know this is one unit because I'm looking at the scale up here. And then I'm going to see, yeah, I'm sorry, See how many squares, or sorry, how many units I need to go up till I get to the graph. So effectively making this little triangle. So it's gone up from this point just here to that point just there. So from negative eight to negative five, it's increased by three units. So I've gone across one unit and it's gone up by three. And that is the steepness, that is the gradient. So I know that my function is gonna start y equals three x. I've then got to find out the y-intercept. So the y-intercept is, where does the graph cross the y-axis? So this vertical axis here. So the blue line crosses just here, where y is seven. So I just put plus seven at the end. So this graph has the function y equals three x at seven. Let's have a look at another example with a similar thing. So again, I'm going to start off by writing y equals mx plus c. And let's think about the things I want to find out. So I want to be able to find out the gradient. And that's going to tell me the coefficient of x. And I want to find out the y-intercept. And that's going to tell me uh, what the constant is. So let's do the gradient first. So again, I'm going to choose a lattice point. And it doesn't matter which lattice point that you choose on your graph because on a linear graph, the gradient is the same all along the line. The gradient is just a fancy way of saying steepness. Now here, if I go across one unit, it's not necessarily very obvious um, exactly how much you've gone up, but I've not gone up a lot at all. So what I'm actually gonna do is I'm gonna go across two units and go up one. And here, I'm going to use a little bit of uh, um, calculus um, really so I'm going to do dy over dx so the difference in y which is how much it's gone up so people talk about ro rise over run so that's my rise it's gone up one and the run is how much the graph's gone across two that's another way of finding the gradient so one over two is just half so I could either write a half or 0 0.5 so y equals half of x and again, the other bit is I just need to find out the y-intercept. So where does it cross the y-axis? So the blue line of the graph crosses through that axis at negative seven. So it's going to put y equals minus x, sorry, y equals half x minus seven. Okay, so that's what I would do. So that's a little bit of a tricky one with that gradient. It's not an integer. Quick look at averages and spread. So when we say averages, we want to be able to find the mean the median, the mode, and the range. 
of a list of numbers. So let's start by finding the mean. To find the mean, we'd add up all our numbers and then divide them by how many we've got. So we're going to do negative 5, add 6, add 1, add 7, add 1, add 3. So let's do that bit first. So again, I wouldn't be a hero here, so just literally type it in. Negative 5, add 6, add 1, add 7, add 1, add 3. You don't get extra marks for doing this in your head. Now that gives me 13. The second part of finding the mean is to divide that by how many numbers there are. So on this occasion, there's six. So I'm going to write my division like a fraction. So 13 over six. OK. Well, that's actually just an improper fraction. So if we work that out, that gives us um, 2.16. But when I write that, um, I'll look at my calculator. That six has got a little dot above it. And that little dot above the six is really important. That means it's 2.16 recurring, so 2.166666. But that little dot is our shorthand notation for it. Now, the next one, the median, is the middle number, but we can only do that once all of the numbers have been written in order. So let's write them in order, smallest to largest. So I've got a 5, a 1, a 1, a 3, a 6, and a 7. So I've got those, and then I can start crossing these numbers off from the ends until I work to the middle. But I've got a little bit of a problem here. So I've got both of these numbers in the middle. So I've got a one and a three. Do I choose both? No. What's actually in the middle of those two numbers? So in the middle of a one and a three would be a two. So here, the median of this set of numbers is two. The mode is the most popular number, okay? Or the most common number. So what I think of is the word kind of uh, model fashion what's the most fashionable number so here the number that comes up more than the others is the number one and the range is your highest number take away your lowest number now it's useful if you've already found out the median because you can really easily identify the highest was seven and the lowest is negative five so i've got to subtract negative five remember again if this is paper two or three this is a calculate paper type it into your calculator and that's going to tell you it's 12. And if you want to think about that one a little bit more, if you think about a number line, so let's say kind of our zeros down here, when we're finding the range, we are finding out how far these two numbers are apart. So the first part of that journey up here, well, that's five, that's another seven, so overall it's 12. Now, occasionally you might get asked to find some averages when you've got the information in a table rather than just as a list. And doing averages in tables is actually really useful. It's a really good quick method if there's lots of bits of data. Um, and so this can be a really useful skill. So here I've got a little table I've made about um, the number of pets people have. So four people have got no pets, six people have one pet, two people have two pets, and four people have three pets. Now, we might get asked to find out all sorts of things. So we might get asked to find the mode. So what's the most common number of pets? Well, more people have one pet than anything else. So the six people have one pet. So that is going to be the mode here. If it asks me um, for the median, so the median is the middle number. So one of the things I want to know is how many numbers are there? So to do that, I'm going to add up the frequency. So the total of the frequency is 4, add 6, add 2, add 4. So that's going to be 16. So the middle number is actually, when you look at this, it's actually in between um, the 8th and the 9th, kind of like the 8th and a half number. So the first four numbers are in the first category. The next six are in the category for one pet. So actually, by the time I get to this row, 10 people have uh, being surveyed so the median is also one that's actually a surprisingly tricky one often the most common thing to get asked here though is to work out the mean and it's a nice shortcut for this so to do that i would make this column at the end that's left blank fx okay and we then multiply the first two columns together so zero times four is zero one times six is six two times two is four and three times four is 12. I can then add those together. So if I add all of those together, I get 22. Okay. 
So I've got a total of 22 and I've got a frequency total of 16. So to find out the actual mean, I do a division. And again, I'm going to type that into my calculator. So 22 divided by 16, and that gives me in this case 1.3. A seven five, and when I'm checking to see if that answer is sensible, this is talking about kind of like the average number of pets in this case, so it's got to be somewhere between zero and three. So at least it seems like a, a sensible um, answer, and actually more people have one pet um, than anything else, so seems sensible. Slightly harder version of this question, this kind of takes it up a grade. We've got a different type of data, so this data is continuous here and it's continuous data because it's been measured so if somebody's measured the height of plants and we can see that um, five plants are in between zero and ten centimeters three are in between ten and twenty eight are in between twenty and thirty and one is in between thirty and forty okay so with data like this we don't actually know the heights of the individual plants so here it might ask us to estimate the mean now to do this, I've now got two extra columns. So I'm going to have one for what's called the midpoint. So the midpoint is the middle of this bit of data. So in between zero and 10, I've got five, 15, and I have 25 and 35. And we do that because we don't know for this first group how tall these five plants are. They might all be one centimeter. They might all be kind of um, 9.93 centimeters. We don't know. So the fairest thing is to assume it's in the middle. And then what we're going to do is we're going to have the FX column again. And we're going to do some multiplication. And for the first one, we're doing the frequency times the midpoint. So five times five. We're then going to do three times five. Sorry, three times 15. So three times 15 is 45. We're going to do eight times 25. Now that's 200 and one times 35. OK. And then we're going to find out the total of the frequency column again. So we're going to find out this total here. So 5 add 3, add 8, add 1. So that's 17, I think. Um, just check that quickly. Seems right. And we're going to add up the FX column. So I can see I've got 70, 270, add 35. That looks like three and five. And again, you can just use a calculator with this. So when you're then finding the estimate for the mean, you would do your total for the FX column divided your, by your total for your frequency column. And you sometimes see this written as this. Sorry, well, I had, um, some of the frequency. So the sum of fx, so that's what the sigma means, the Greek letter. You'd sometimes see that if you're using Excel spreadsheets, that kind of thing. Um, so you just find your total of your fx column, your total of your frequency column, and do that as a division. So again, I'm just going to type it in now. So 305 divided by 17, and that's giving me an answer of 17. I'm just going to do this to one that's more place, 9. And that's going to be centimetres because we're looking at heights of plants. So is that sensible? Well, the shortest plant can't be any shorter than zero. It can't be any taller than 40. So 17.9 seems, again, seems like a sensible answer. Um, just before going, to give you one very final um, bit of information, one very final tip, is occasionally you might get asked a question on this. And if you just imagine if this is your page of your exam and it's got the question it might have a bit of writing at the top and then it might have the table and it might only have a couple of columns in the table and it might not be in the middle now often if it's not in the middle it's often for a purpose because they might think okay do they know that they need sorry, I just did some different color do they know that they need to put on extra columns to help with this question so it might be that if they've not drawn the table out fully, it might be kind of put to the left and it might just give you the space to draw those columns in for yourself. OK, useful tip worth knowing that one. So I hope this is really useful to you all. Good luck for your exams. Thank you for watching.